Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to this term's research conversations. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first pair of conversationists. So we have Dr. Dr. Christian Zana, who is the Associate Professor of Islamic History. He's going to be in conversation with Professor David Taylor, who is Associate Professor of Aramaic and Syriac. And they're going to be talking about Christian's book on Christian neo-martyrs of the early Islamic period. Thank you very much all for, for coming out when you could be sitting outside in the baking hot sunshine and enjoying, <laughs> enjoying the British summer at its full, so we're, we're very glad that you, you came out for this. Um, Christian's going to, uh, the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to introduce Christian briefly and then uh, let him talk for about 10 minutes about his research project. And then I will try and think of the most fiendish questions I can think of to throw at him, which uh, I'm hoping, unfortunately, he seems to have already anticipated most of them, but we'll, we'll see how it do, does with that. And then it's over to you to kind of ask questions. So rather than waiting till I say, do any of you have questions, you might want to start thinking about that as he's talking, uh, or just make something up as we go along. Okay, so you will have all seen Christian around the, uh, the faculty this year. He was appointed at the beginning of this uh, academic year. His, uh, his CV, very brief CV, is that he was an undergraduate at Princeton. He then came to Oxford in 2009 for uh, an MPhil in uh, Byzantine studies, or at least he got his MPhil in 2009 for MPhil in Byzantine studies in Arabic, so some of you will have seen him in his previous incarnation here. Went back to Princeton for an MA in history and then did his PhD at Princeton, where he had a sort of, in late antique history terms, a sort of dream team that he was advised by Peter Brown and Michael Cook, which he's got means he can tick both the kind of Islam and Christianity boxes. And then he was examined by John Holden and Robert Hoyland, so he gets both Byzantine studies and Islamic history kind of brought in. Before coming to us, he was a, a, a postdoc at uh, St. John's College in Cambridge. Now, later this summer, he has this book coming out, Christian Martyrs Under Islam, Religious Violence and the Making of the uh, Muslim World. It's available on Amazon uh, in both places, and like all the best Hollywood movies, it's going to be released slightly earlier in the States in August and uh, in the UK in September. But if you ask Christian nicely, he's got lots of forms that will give you an, uh, a discount on it, and it's very cheap. On that, Christian, you might want to tell us something about it. <laughs> well, I hope that the cheapness does not correlate to the quality no, of no, the no, ideas. No, no. Um, you get a lot of pages for yeah, your money. That's right, yeah. that's right. A rare academic book that will not set you back several paychecks. So um, anyway, uh, thank you, David, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Mark, for the invitation um, to take part in this. It's been uh, a whirlwind of a first year, but I'm extremely happy to be back in Oxford um, and to have gotten to know so many of you around the table and in the room today. Um, as David says, uh, my book is out this summer. Uh, this is based on my PhD thesis. So uh, for those of you who have been through this process before, you'll know that modifying your PhD thesis is like being pregnant for many, many, many years um, and also undergoing many different facelifts in the process, not to combine different medical terminology. But I'm, to make a long story short, I'm very happy that it's out and to be moving on to new things, but to share a bit of my findings uh, with you today. Um, so to, to collapse a, a long story into just a few minutes of comments, uh, I think it goes without saying that the rise of Islam, and particularly the Arab conquest of the 7th and of the 8th centuries, mark one of the most significant watersheds um, in the history of the world, full stop. Um, in a matter of just a few generations, uh, Arab armies, of course, emerge from the Arabian Peninsula and establish an empire that stretches all the way from uh, the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the west to the Hindu Kush, to the Punjab in Central Asia. Um, this is an incredible achievement. Um, but uh, we should not mistake the massive political changes of the 7th and 8th centuries to necessarily correspond to massive demographic, religious, or cultural changes on the ground, because all of those things happen very slowly. And that's where my book comes in. Um, when we speak about the territories of the early Islamic Caliphate, at least west of Iran, we're speaking about majority Christian populations in places like Al-Andalus, Spain, uh, North Africa, Egypt, the Levant, 
many parts of Mesopotamia and the Caucasus. These are all essentially Christian societies, uh, late antique Christian societies of the kind that David studies too, uh, that f find themselves living under Muslim rule. Um, so an Islamic society is a long time in the making uh, despite the emergence of an Islamic polity that is relatively quick in the making. Um, and that chasm is something that fascinates me. It's essentially what the book is about. And so I'm interested in the ways in which this, these Christian societies um, slowly transform um, into uh, medieval Islamic societies. Um, and here, uh, the, our best guesses on when a place like Egypt or Syria, Palestine flip and become majority Muslim um, is extremely opaque. Essentially, we don't have particularly good information, demographic information, census information of the kind that could really help us pinpoint this securely, uh, but we can estimate. Um, and what most scholars believe is that many of these areas cross the threshold of a Muslim demographic majority hundreds and hundreds of years after the Arab conquest. So I'm interested in that process, and the book in particular is interested in the role of coercion and bloodshed in this process. Uh, to what extent was this uh, a relatively peaceful thing? To what extent um, did, uh, say, unhappier historical factors play a role? And just to be upfront about where I stand, I actually don't think that persecution has a particularly uh, robust uh, role and a robust effect in the process of Islamization. Uh, there are, of course, discrete moments and episodes of violence, um, but by and large, uh, relations between Muslims and Christians in this period were characterized by, I, by what I call uh, a, a begrudging but relatively peaceful form of coexistence. Uh, theological, religious, and social rivals whose relations were offset by an obvious imbalance in political power. Um, but the slow pace of change in the Middle East in this time is a testament um, to the relative absence of the kind of focused, uh, 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 intense persecution that we sometimes assume uh, when we read the popular press, when we think about popular culture and its vision of early Islamic history. Now, that being said, uh, there are these episodes uh, of intense violence, and they constitute the subject of my book. Uh, the book is built around a series of case studies, um, the lives of martyrs, individuals who were killed largely by uh, Islamic authorities in these first two or three centuries, um, who were then remembered as saints, and as such are commemorated in hagiographical texts um, from the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. Um, these texts have largely been neglected. In other words, they have not really been pooled together to tell a broad history of social relationships between Muslims and Christians. Uh, but to my eyes, at least, they're among the richest uh, and most valuable uh, sources that can provide insight onto this extremely complex, consequential process. Uh, they're written in a kaleidoscope of ancient and medieval languages, including Greek, Arabic, uh, Latin in the West, uh, Armenian, Georgian, um, as well as Syriac. And they tell us the lives of three different groups of people by and large. Uh, the first and most significant group of martyrs are converts from Christianity to Islam who, for a variety of reasons, essentially go back on the initial decision, return from the mosque to the church, and as such are executed as apostates. Uh, as many of you will know, under classical Islamic law, apostasy was considered a capital offense. So that's the first and most significant group. Uh, the second largest group are apostates, individuals who were born into entirely Muslim families who undergo a perhaps even more surprising trip from the mosque to the church. And finally, uh, blasphemers, people who do not undergo the kinds of religious transformations I've described, but who respond to many of the same social and cultural pressures uh, and lash out against the Islamic authorities, mm -hmm. against various core aspects of Islamic belief the standing of the Prophet Muhammad being the most important. So I tried to combine these Christian hagiographical texts uh, with Islamic historical and legal sources to build uh, a robust and a textured context for understanding this violence. In other words, to report both sides of a two-way conversation. Um, what are my big conclusions out of this? I'm happy to talk about specific case studies if you're interested during questions and answers. But my big conclusion is that the pace uh, of that, that violence, um, as well as the pace of conversion, uh, really accelerates uh, during the first 50 years of Abbasid rule. That is to say, from the year 750 until roughly 800. Um, we might ask, why is it the case that um, so much of this tension really erupts generations and generations after the initial advent of Islam? Um, 
Well, it seems that violence erupts precisely in the context of a society that is emerging that is ever more integrated, in which the traditional <coughs> distinctions between Arabs, uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims, as Arabs and non-Arabs, as city dwellers and country dwellers, as soldiers and peasants, that these distinctions are collapsing um, as Islam reaches ever more into the countryside, as uh, non-Arabs join Islam in large numbers. And it's precisely this process of integration that provokes uh, the Muslim authorities to police boundaries between communities that had been less uh, well policed before, more porous in previous generations, uh, and in turn prompts Christian writers to commemorate this violence in literary form and to produce the text that I'm focusing on in the book. Uh, so far from being a, a, a one-way street, of violence and activity from Muslims upon Christians, um, I view this as a reciprocal process, a cyclical process, whereby violence takes place um, and Christians respond to this violence in the form of text production, which in turn creates memory, creates uh, uh, senses of identity that are grounded in memories of conflict. Um, and the last thing that I'll say uh, before we dive into some questions uh, is that uh, of course, the source material I'm working with is potentially very problematic. <coughs> For anyone who has read Christian saints' lives from any period, uh, you'll know that these are not exactly straightforward historical texts. Uh, these are filled with literary tropes, often extremely fantastical elements that we as historians have to judge um, with a certain degree of incredulity. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they reveal to my eyes um, a conversation, an otherwise somewhat subterranean conversation among Christian communities at this time um, with tensions over how to respond to the rise of Islam, um, whether the proper posture of churches in these different areas was to uh, engage the Islamic authorities on positive, constructive, and submissive terms, um, or instead the proper posture was one of resistance. Um, and this camp, this group, this orientation of resistance, in my view, um, is the party that is largely responsible for the texts that survive to this day. Um, so uh, the texts reveal internal divides that we otherwise can't see, um, and they help shed light on the emergence of mentalities uh, that uh, are often invisible in the usual types of sources that we use to reconstruct the events of early Islamic history, uh, namely chronicles, legal sources written in Arabic uh, by Muslims. Uh, so this is about creating a three-dimensional view of a society that has many different components, um, not just Arabic speakers and not just Muslims, but Christians of many different varieties using different languages and coming from different uh, ecclesiastical traditions. So. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Now, you've strongly hinted at some of the difficulties in dealing with this material. And if I were a supervisor being presented with this as a thesis topic, I, I, I would be very, very nervous indeed. You've got a methodological series of nightmares uh, in, in handling these sort of materials. And, it, and it's clear that you've, you, you, you're very clear, it's, it's clear from reading the book that you are very aware of those and you're dealing with those. But I want to bring some of those out so people see the sort of issues. Um, the opening words of your preface, the very opening words are, some readers may open this book seeking answers about the tumult that currently roils the Middle East. This book does not engage in comparisons between religious violence in the early Islamic era and violence today. But isn't it argued that the book's actually kind of predicated on that same sort of understanding of violence, and that the, the issues raised by contemporary, contemporary events are in a sense driving the book? I mean, particularly given your subtitle, Religious Violence and the Making of the Islamic World, or the Muslim World, sorry. I mean, if you'd studied Christian medics, you could have Christian medics under Islam, shared science and the making of the Muslim world, mm. which, which, mi which might be a more you know, um, productive way of seeing the modern Muslim world coming in, but isn't very much in vogue at the moment. Mm. How do you adjust to this? To the, how, do, how would you respond to this idea that what you're doing is responding in explicitly really to yeah. what's going on or what has gone on uh, under ISIS. Yeah. So I, I should say that by way of a bit of autobiography of this book, uh, I began writing as a doctoral dissertation just as the Arab Spring was underway. Um, and so I I in a way there was a somewhat eerie process of writing this project over the course of now seven years and, and encountering in the text that I was using from the early medieval period themes that resonated unhappily 
um, with a lot of themes that we found in uh, the front pages of our newspapers over the past few years, in particular the, uh, the persecution of various uh, religious minorities, not just Christians, principally Christians, but including many others, such as the Yazidis um, in northern Iraq as well as Syria. So this was a, um, an unwanted parallel um, that popped up as I was writing, and I'm under no illusions as to why a certain type of reader will probably be drawn to the book less out of interest in the events of the antique history in the early Islamic period, but out of a desire to put contemporary events in a historical context. And for that type of reader, I, want, I don't want to disown the parallels, right? The parallels exist um, in part because the Islamic State as a group that was relentlessly textual, as a group that styled itself as the faithful successor to the early caliphates of the post-conquest period, very deliberately engaged in behavior that echoed um, what they believed happened at the origins of Islam. Um, so those parallels exist. They're there for the reader to draw. I don't draw them myself. I'm happy to discuss them, of course. Um, but for me, the takeaway from uh, all of my research um, done against the backdrop of these events is as much the ways in which the, the um, uh, relations between the two communities at the origins of Islam look actually very, very different mm. from some of these um, sad turn of events over the recent years. And here I think the key question is, is violence representative mm. of the standard way in which these two communities relate, or is it exceptional? Mm. Are we looking at the rule or exceptions to the rule? Mm. And one of the things that I argue in the book is that these are in fact exceptions to the rule. Um, you know, violence is uh, important to study in this period, not because it's emblematic of the ways in which daily relations actually happened, but in fact, these are breaks from the norm. So these are, you know, this is a society in which intermarriage is extremely common. This is a society in which Christians and Muslims are rubbing shoulders in city blocks, um, are working together. And it's often these messy contexts where we don't necessarily see conflict, where violence arises. So, so and that's the significant so, takeaway. So, 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 so. What we have here is a corpus of really interesting texts that have all sorts of interesting materials, but what you want to do is, is social history mm -hmm. of these texts. And to many historians, the word hagiography is shorthand for a fabulous, pious myth. You, you, you quoted a, a German scholar who called it a kirchlicher Schwindel literatur <laughs> as a kind of extreme end of what's going on there. Um, do these texts tell us anything really about contemporary is the Islamic world, or do they tell us about the Christian imagination some period later, about how people ought to have responded? Yeah. This is not meant to be an academic fudge, but in my opinion, it's not an <laughs> That means it's going to be an <laughs> academic fudge. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard that one before. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a false dichotomy to say that it's either or. I <clears> believe it's and both. And the book engages in both styles of analysis. Mm. I try to write um, what you might call a positive form of social mm. history, not positive mm. in a sense that I want to make it all seem rosy, mm. but positive in the sense that I think that we can extract mm. empirical information, so to speak, about the way things actually were. But I also view these texts as residues of kind of literary um, and ideological mm. debates within communities. And so um, what I had to do was learn to read mm. these texts at, at two levels. And so depending on the chapter mm. that you read in the book, you'll find different mm. styles of analysis. The early chapters get at this hard question of how did people convert? How did people apostatize? Mm. What did blasphemy mean? And the latter chapters get at, get at more of this literary turn, which has been extremely popular in the analysis of hagiography yeah. in recent years. But it, I mean, if we look at the life of, just very briefly, the mm. summary life of one of the most famous of the, the martyrs, uh, Rauk al Karashi, mm -hmm. uh, who became known as Antony, who, who was martyred in 799 in Damascus. This is somebody who's said to be a nobleman, possibly from the family of the prophet. He, he, he persecutes a local church, fires an arrow at an mm. icon. The icon stops, whizzes back, goes through his hand. He gets plagued by St. Theodore, whose icon it was. He goes to Jerusalem where the authorities won't uh, baptize him. So he gets baptized in the River Jordan before coming back to Damascus, mm. where, where, where he's martyred by Harun al-Rashid. Mm -hmm. All of which, how do you then extract any historical mm. data from that? <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, just, I mean, it's a practical problem. What, what do you of do course. with that? Well, I mean, what compounds that also is that this, that this life of this alleged individual becomes a template for other hagiographical texts that happen in later periods. So what David has just described of the miraculous icon, the arrow that flies through the, the hand, and all of this gets repeated in texts in Greek as well as in Latin, things like this. So, I mean, how do we deal mm. with this individual? Uh, uh, you know, clearly there are fantastical elements. Mm. I try to treat these martyrs on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. I think that just as we, we should not be um, 
we shouldn't mm -hmm. embrace and accept all of these as being historical personalities. Mm -hmm. I think that likewise it would be foolhardy to treat all of these texts as pure, mm -hmm. you know, as hagiographic fiction. Mm -hmm. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. What I'd say with respect to the one that you just mentioned is that, of course, there are these unbelievable elements that smack of hagiographic mm -hmm. invention. But that text in particular, like many in the genre, are also loaded with extremely concrete um, contextual information that make, that, that to my eyes at least make them seem uh, plausible reflections of a social reality. Maybe this guy didn't exist, but that there were these exceptional individuals from the Muslim upper classes who for eccentric and inexplicable reasons are tempted to actually go over to Christianity or engage in behaviors that blur the boundaries, mm. such as what we mm. see in that text, that strikes me as plausible. Mm. And it gets at the question of reception. You know, I don't think, my claim is that it's impossible <laughs> to establish really whether any of these texts actually happened. But what we can do as historians is establish whether they are plausible. And my argument in most instances, mm. again, building a context using Islamic mm. sources from the same period, um, is that more often than not, these sources are plausible mm. and, and are not outside the norm mm. of the ways in which we understand Muslims and Christians to mm. be relating at this time. I, I mean, clearly there's, there's, there is a long-standing debate about the degree of tolerance and intolerance mm. in the early Islamic period. Was it an ideal period of tolerance? Uh, that was ended by crusades and other things, or was it a period of intolerance and you know, uh, uh, conversion or the sword, as it mm. were? Where do you stand on on that sort of sliding scale? I mean, to what extent are your martyr acts typical of that process, or to what extent should we actually be looking at people who just saw a new religion that they really admired and they wanted to embrace because of all the positive features of that? Yeah. Well. Uh, for me, the Islamic authorities actually emerge from these texts somewhat positively um, in chapter 4, which explores the judicial context for much of the violence and the trials. Um, what pops up is that there's a very deliberate effort to portray the Islamic authorities as acting in a way that ostentatiously adheres to the law. Uh, you might argue that this is as much of a hagiographic motif as stories about miraculous mm -hmm. icons. But again, um, in my research, I discovered ex extremely precise and surprising correspondence mm -hmm. between the accounts of trials, the accounts of tortures that we find in the text, and what Islamic legal sources mm -hmm. tell us from the same period. So the state, by and large, handles its non-Muslim population with a very laissez-faire attitude. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that it takes so long for uh, the majority population of the Middle East to become Muslim is that the state basically doesn't have a strong interest mm -hmm. in seeing these people convert. Uh, there's a big tug of war between an ideological desire to exemplify that Islam is a universal religion and as such can embrace all of society with the practical realization that this was a religion of the governing class, mm -hmm. that that status is diluted with the conversion of the hoi polloi down below, a certain ambivalence about whether early Islam is just for the Arabs or is truly for everyone else, and furthermore, this is the tax base, and mm -hmm. you tax non-Muslims at a higher rate, and when the tax, when people convert, your tax base contracts. Mm -hmm. So th these are not rosy reasons why we have positive relations between Muslims and Christians, but a range of kind of theological, legal, and practical considerations mm -hmm. that, to my eyes, undergird not a culture of constant persecution <coughs> and intolerance, but rather a world in which people kind of get on, um, in which there are power structures mm -hmm. that, that, that set these relations. Um, but yeah, my, the takeaway from my book is, is not a world of persecution, mm. but rather essentially a world where people uh, are, are, are neighbors, but those relations are punctuated by these ferocious episodes of violence. Okay. Thank you. I've got all sorts of other things I'd like to ask, but we may have to do that over a, a coffee or a beer. I think I should open it up to everyone else to have a chance to, to raise things. If you don't come up with questions soon, then I'll throw some of my others in. But uh, do you have some questions you'd like to put to Christian? <laughs> I told you to think yeah, about something. Salam, 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 thank you. Go on. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Uh, my question is about um, the social realities uh, that you claim these texts are reflecting. And I haven't read your book, and I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. And uh, I was going to jump straight to the thesis, but now it's out as a book. You know, I'll wait for the book. But um, so, um, it's for me, it's not so much. I agree, it's not so. It, it's not so much about, you know, historical plausibility in the kind of literal sense, the kind of positivistic sense. But, yeah, I agree that one can potentially read a, a social reality. Uh, but I suppose my question is, what makes that social reality exceptionally late antique? Mm -hmm. So you're taking these texts, and, and by your own admission, 
they're composed sometime after the events they claim mm. to have happened actually happened. So um, you haven't said when they were composed mm. by and large so far, but mm. from my own experience, I know that a lot of these are mm. late medieval, sometimes even okay. early modern uh, literary construction. Okay. Right? And yeah. again, we're back to reception. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. And, and can I, Sam? Can I cut sure. you off there? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get that bit dating and other things. Yeah. No. No. This, this is. More than dating. I know it's more than dating, dating, but I, I, I'm. Maybe just in the interest of being concise, because we only have about ten minutes left, I'll deal with the dating, and maybe I can nod in the direction of the bigger th question you're asking. Um, the material evidence is extremely significant, and I have, a sig I have a section of the book in which I talk about manuscripts and authorship and the chasm mm -hmm. between the event allegedly happening and the composition of the text. And again, to go back to a point I just made to David, I think that making sweeping generalizations would be unwise. Um, there are some texts in which it, it is obvious that, the, that the, the source is probably written in relatively close proximity, just a few years, perhaps even months after the event. Um, and there are contextual details in the text that give us confidence that that is true. Um, the manuscripts, and then there are other instances in which we're clearly dealing with fantasies that are composed at a much, much later date. Um, the earliest manuscripts that we have probably date to 100 years after. Now, what the very earliest manuscripts looked like, um, it's impossible to say. Um, there are instances of martyrologies that are probably written in this early medieval context but only survive in early modern copies. And this applies especially to a genre of texts that were written originally in, say, Greek as well as in Arabic uh, in the Levant, but survive only in, uh, say, Georgian translations. There are important ecclesiastical contacts between the Christian, the Melkite communities of the Holy Land and their religious counterparts in the Caucasus. So again, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and I try to be judicious in that respect in the book. But um, yeah, they are writing in a late antique hagiographical tradition, and as such, as the, as the, um, you know, the historian, we have to approach them uh, with an eye to genre, with an mm -hmm. eye to convention, and try and peel apart the ways in which authors are nodding to the literary customs that are behind them, but also addressing the realities on the ground that are in front of them. Thank you. Uh, that was a really interesting set of propositions. Question about Spain. Um, so you give this role for the Abbasids in the early Abbasid period, intensifying contacts between Christians and Muslims, and this necessitating the greater policing of boundaries, including with violence. Um, is this peculiar to the Abbasid regime, the Abbasid regime's decisions, or is it just a phenomenon that's going to happen after you've had a hundred odd years of contact between Jews and between Christians and Muslims when settlement has started to occur. So, does Spain look like the other the Abbasid provinces, or is, is does Spain obey different kinds of patterns? Yeah, I mean, I think that there probably are specific ideological characteristics of the Abbasid regime that makes them more likely or more more concerned with the proper boundary maintenance between themselves and their non-Muslim population. But by and large, I think that there is a social and a demographic process that unfolds on tape, uh, not on tape delay, but rather on, uh, uh, as a consequence of a certain distance and a certain reconfiguration of society that happens X number of generations after the initial advent of Islam. So you raise Spain, and actually in my chapter on blasphemy, I deal extensively with probably what is the most well-known single martyrdom episode from this period. And these, this is the so-called court of a martyrs incident. Uh, which happens between 850 and 859. We have an abundance of texts from two authors written in Latin that, again, they adhere to the conventions of the genre more broadly, but they give us this uh, extremely interesting uh, stories of, of, of blasphemy, largely, um, at the Umayyad court in, uh, in, in Cordoba. And there, my argument is essentially what you've just hinted at, that, um, that the 850s emerge as a significant moment in the history of Islam in Al-Andalus, precisely because we're seeing a certain um, um, uh, unfolding of dynamics that happened much earlier in the East as a consequence of the earlier date of the conquest. Um, I think that the violence in Cordoba happens as a consequence of intensifying Islamization, rising numbers of ulama, that is to say Muslim religious scholars, uh, the construction of new mosques. There are all these significant markers of an increasingly and distinctively Islamic society. And this is the context, I think, in which the violence happens in Cordoba, much as it happened, say, 75 years earlier in places like uh, Abbasid Syria and, uh, and, uh, and Palestine. Good. Do we have some more questions? <laughs>
Okay, so again. Uh, maybe Christian, uh, a question that I already asked you before, but again, maybe. How do you explain the virtual absence of uh, this hagiographical material of about martyrdoms in Syria? Mm. Yeah, so this is one of the, this is a big puzzle. Uh, there is one neo-martyr, that is to say there is one martyr uh, killed by the Islamic authorities who is commemorated as a saint in the West Syrian or Miaphysite church. Um, essentially none others. We have hints in chronicles, we have hints in some liturgical sources that there may have been some sharing between the West Syrians and other denominations, but by and large it's kind of, there's this conspicuous absence, there's a gap. I would say the same applies to the East Syrians, uh, the Church of the East. Um, uh, I would say the same applies to the Copts in Egypt. So we have to account for the, the, um, the, the absence of martyrs in these contexts and the abundance of martyrs in others mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the East, namely the Melkites. Um, complicated reasons, I think that um, m my hunch is that there is a, uh, there's an ideological appeal that martyrs have for those communities who were closest to political power before the advent of Islam um, that sees their situation change dramatically as a result of the conquest. So I think that there's a disorienting process that occurs among the Melkites, the former Byzantine Christians of the Holy Land, um, uh, that makes these stories of resistance, of kind of triumph in the midst of adversity, of suffering, appealing in a way that may have been less true mm -hmm. for the three communities that I mentioned, all of whom to one degree or another stood um, outside or on the margins of political power before the advent of Islam, and so they remained after the advent of Islam. Um, the West Syrians and the Copts, of course, being out of step with the theological positions of the Byzantine Emperor in Constantinople, the East Syrians being out of step, so to speak, with the religious principles of the Zoroastrian kings of kings uh, in the Sasanian period. So I think that there are resources in those traditions that help them make sense of their new predicament uh, that is not true of the Melkites uh, or, for example, of the Spanish Christians who were patronized by the Visigothic kings. So that's the beginning I, of, of what is uh, an extremely complex thing, but you're absolutely right. Okay. If you'd like to know the rest of the complexity, the book is out in August and September. Christian, thank you very thank much. Thank you, David.